In the next chapter, we'll be talking more about how you can explore your data. We'll go into some different topics like how to run simple statistical tests in R, a little bit with how to do regression modeling, and then we'll talk a lot about being able to create and apply your own functions and to apply different functions broadly uh, using the, the map function from the per package. We need to start out by talking about some different data types. So far, we've focused really strongly on data frames. That's the standard format to keep your data in when you're working with tidyverse. Really, many of those functions take a data frame as an input and then also output a data frame. So it keeps your data in that same structure while you're doing all the parts of the analysis. And by keeping it in that same structure, you can combine those different functions in a lot of different orders to do really complex and interesting things. However, there are some other ways that we can store data in R, other classes of R objects, that in some cases are helpful or in some cases are things you're going to run across as you, you expand what you do with the data and expand to use other functions and fit stati statistical tests and things like that. So in this first lecture, I want to talk about two of these, matrices and list. So we'll start with matrices. A matrix will look a lot like a data frame. It looks like this two-dimensional kind of even, even structure. The difference, though, is that all the value, values, not just in one column, but in all columns, have to have the same data class. So they could all be numeric or they could all be characters, but you can't have kind of one column that's numeric and then one column that's a factor and one column that is a character like you can with the data frame. You can also think of this as kind of a wrapped vector. So if you remember, a vector follows that same rule, it has to have everything in it of the same class, the same data type. And so um, if you think of that, a vector is one dimensional. So a matrix is just like that, but we're, we're kind of wrapping it so it becomes two dimensional. And we'll take a look at an example of what that looks like in a minute. These are used sometimes for a few reasons. For one, they can be a little bit faster and more memory efficient than data frames. With many of the data sets that you'll work with, that might not be an issue. Um, our computers tend to be pretty speedy now. However, there are some that you may come across in genomics and with some types of biological data and a few other cases where it really is important to maintain those principles. The other is that a lot of the techniques that we use in statistics are based on linear algebra, and those are really based in working with working with data that is in a matrix format. So we can look a little bit in R about how to construct these and how to work with these, and we'll be going kind of back and forth between the slides and R Studio. But if you'd like to, you're welcome to write your notes uh, on the slides as we do it. So if we go into our studio, and I'll just get down here to the console as we explore this some. If we do just 1 to 10, 1 colon 10, if you'll remember, that creates a vector that goes from the number 1 to the number 10 going by 1. We can use the matrix function to take this vector and move it into the matrix format. So we'll use the matrix function that's in base R, so you don't need to load any additional packages to be able to do that. Take the vector that we were working with before, so that's going from 1 to 10. And then next, we can say how many rows we want to have. So let's say that we wanted these as five columns and two rows. We can do n row equals 5. So you can, uh, you can see now that we have a matrix structure, and everything is in that same data class. It's taken this and it's filled up by going down the first column. And then once it finishes that, it kind of wraps and starts again on the next column. We can define this. We can do it. Maybe let's do this as foo. And then just as a reminder, you can always check to see if your data is in this class or not by using the class function. So we can do class foo, and we'll see that that's a matrix as the main class. If you have something that's not a matrix already, and that is not a vector, if you have a data frame, you can coerce it into this matrix class by doing as.matrix. 
So let's take a look at doing that too. And for this, we could actually pull a data set that, that we already know should be um, a data frame. So we've been working earlier with the Faraway package for some of the data sets there. And we worked with a data set that was called World Cup. So we can load that and we can check and see that that has a data frame class. You can come down to the console and see that that's a data frame. If we want to turn that into a matrix, we can do the name of the function. And then let me uh, do tidyverse so we'll have our pipes. We can run it through as.matrix. If we look down here, you can see now that it's made that change. This is a kind of long data frame. But one of the interesting things to note here is that when we make that change, when we go from a data frame where we're allowed to have columns with different types into a matrix where everything has to have the same data type, it will take any of the columns that don't match up and it will coerce them to be more general of the data types that you have. So for example, in the original data frame here, we had some columns like team and position that were either categorical or a factor. And then we had some like time and shots and passes that were numeric. Because these are two different data types, R has coerced all of these to be a character data type, which is more general. It can kind of hold more of these different types without needing to force a, a missing NA value. And so it's coerced everything into that. We've lost that numeric information that we had for things like time and shots and passes. Now, if we want, we can check and see that if we'd pick just the columns that were numeric, we wouldn't have this issue because they're all numeric and they're all the same data type. It would have left them all as numeric. So we could select just a few of these numeric ones. Maybe let's do time to passes. And now when we run, you can see that we don't have those quotation marks around, around these numbers anymore. Um, so they're now all maintained as new, the numeric class. Once you have one of these matrices, if you want to extract certain pieces, you can use square bracket indexing just like you can with data frames. It has that same convention where the selection you put before the comma will refer to the rows that you want to get and the selection after will refer to the columns. So let's take a look at that. We can actually do this as an example matrix maybe. All right. So if we wanted to pull out, um, let's pull out the first two rows. So we do that first and then a comma and then maybe just the third column. So since that's a single number, we don't need to do that as a vector or do a colon operator. So you can see that that's pulled out that information. Um, let's try again and this time let's take the first and the third maybe. And here we have that full one. And you can see for the smaller one, it actually looks like it might have coerced it back into a vector since it was just something in a single dimension and that's why things are kind of like laid out like that. Whereas when we take a subset that still has that two dimensional format, it's re retaining it as a matrix. One thing to, to, to note here, one thing that's really important though, is that you can't use dplyr functions, many of them, directly with matrices. So for example, um, we've used functions like, like slice and select before. If we had a data frame, if we had this World Cup data frame where we've picked out these two columns and look at that. So if we wanted to get data that covered the first two rows and then columns one and three, what we could do is we could do slice to get these first two rows. And then we could do select to get col the columns in positions one and three. 
So if we run that, we can see that we've got an ad. This is working with World Cup directly as a data frame. But if we convert it into a matrix first, this won't work anymore because there aren't these functions for select and slice. You can see that we get an error that there's no applicable method for select for a matrix. Sometimes in our examples in class, when we have gotten our data in as a matrix, we've converted it into a data frame or into a tibble for this very reason. So we could go through and use the dplyr functions that need that class as their input and give that class as their output. So that was covering matrices, and we'll see a little bit more with those as we look at, at the, um, the generalized linear modeling and linear regression models. The other object, the other uh, class that I want to make sure that you're clear on are list. I think of list sometimes as like the kitchen sink of our objects. You might have heard that as a case where you kind of got everything there, you could put everything there. So they're a very flexible format for storing data. And that turns out to be really helpful because as we'll learn later this in this chapter, when we write our own functions, we can do a lot of things with that, but one of the limitations is we can usually only send one thing out at the end. So we can do a lot of actions, but then when it's time to return it to the main R session, to the user, you can only send one object through. A list allows you to put a lot of things in that one object and they can be things that include multiple other objects. So um, several data frames or a data frame and a vector or something like that. So that flexible nature makes them very useful, especially for, for passing things out of functions in R. The problem with this though, is that a lot of times when you get those lists out, they really are not tidy data. So we've talked about tidy data, both as being data that's in these data frames that kind of have a, a two-dimensional, non-ragged ragged structure. Um, but, but we've also really talked about them in, in terms of some of the characteristics for how you put that data together as well, that you have a row for each observation and you have a column for every variable. List do not follow typically that two-dimensional structure, although it turns out a data frame actually is a special class of list. But many lists are more expansive and flexible and don't fit into that very specific structure. That means that we have to think a little bit about how we can include them and include results that are in list as we're creating this kind of tidy pipeline of data. So we have to think about pulling out parts that are tidy if we want to continue with using those different functions or using something like ggplot to visualize. So we're going to take a look some at how to do that as we work through this class because it turns out, the, the, this chapter, because it turns out that quite a lot of the statistical functions that we're going to look at in this chapter do return a list to you. So let's take a look at an example. And again, we can use a function with a very clear name to create this type of object. So when we were looking at matrices, the function that we used to make one was matrix. When we look at list, the function that we use to make them is list. So let's take a look and we can clean up some of this, but we'll leave the tidyverse perhaps. So we can make a new list. And when we make that list, we can include the names of elements and then put in what we want. So we could start just with one element. Maybe let me call this element one. And let's see, let's do a sample of numbers. So this sample will take uh, the vector of numbers one to five and it will sample five numbers out from that. So we can run just this so far and then take a look you can see that we've got element one, and then within that, it looks like a vector. We've got five of those different numbers. We can add things on though. So right now it doesn't feel much fancier than if we just had a vector, but we can fit different things in. So if we wanted to put another element in here, we could. So for the second one, let's do a tibble and let's put in the first three letters and the first three numbers, and we'll name those columns letters and numbers. So I'll call this element two. So 
So we'll make a tibble in the first column again, we're gonna call letters. And we can actually use um, a vector that comes with R called letters for this. So this letters vector that comes with R, if you take a look at it, it's all the lowercase letters from A through Z. So by doing letters one to three with that square bracket indexing, we'll be pulling ABC, which you can see down here. All right, and then the second column that we want, I put that too far out. So we can do numbers equals, and we'll just do the first three numbers. So now when we run it and look at it, you can see that things are starting to get a little bit more filled in. So we've got this first element called element one that's a vector with numbers, and it's got a sample of the numbers one to 10. And then we've got element two that is a, a different class it's, it's a tibble, and in this case, it's got two columns, and we've got a mix where some of our values are in that character data type and some of them are in a numeric data type. So again, this is a structure you can think of as a way to really store lots of different things. And again, the reason that that's very helpful is because for many of our for writing functions in R, you typically can only pass out one thing. And so this is a way to get a lot of things out from the code that was running inside the function. If you want to extract something from a list, you can certainly do that. We've looked at the square bracket indexing and the dollar signs before as way to, ways to extract things from data frames. So you can use these in a similar way, but in some cases there are some pieces that are just a little bit different. So the first is that we can use the dollar sign to extract certain elements. So for example, we have this list that we've named very unimaginatively A. I can extract element one by doing A dollar sign element one. When you do that, it's really going kind of down in and pulling out just the piece that you had. So in other words, it's pulling out element one, which is a vector and it's pulling it out as a vector. And we can check that, we can do the as.vector function, and we can see, we should be able to see that that's true, maybe let's do it like this. Oh, sorry, is.vector. There we go, and we can see that that is true, that it has pulled that out as a vector. The other way that we can extract different elements from a list let's say in this case that we wanna pull out that second element, that data frame, is we can use square bracketing. But to pull out these elements with a list, we need to use double square brackets. So we'll take the name of the list, we've named it A in this case, and do a double square bracket, and then say we want to pull out the second element. So the first element is the first thing you see with the dollar sign here, the second element is the second. So if we do that, you can see that it's pulled out a tibble just of that second piece. So these are our two main ways of doing that, that indexing to extract a certain piece. We can do the dollar sign if we want to use the name, or we can use double square brackets if we want to do it by position. We can even access specific values within a list element. So let's say in this list, again, I'll print it out. We want to pull out element two, but not all of it, just this numbers column. And you can see, just like any columns in a data frame, if we pull it all the way out, that'll just be the vector that went into that. So we can do the name of the list, and then we can say that we want the second element, and then we can say that we want the numbers element of that. And you can see that that's pulled that out as the numbers. With the square bracketing, we also could have done this with position if we wanted, so we know it's gonna be the second thing. And then this is not the first column, that's letters, it's the second column. So we can pull this out as the second value here as well. Next, let's talk about a few ways, if you have a list that you can explore it and try to figure out what's inside it. So the first thing is to check to make sure that the object that you're working with really is a list. So you'll have so, some clues to kind of walk down this pathway. You can use the class function again to do that. So you do class with whatever the name of your object is. And in this case, that's confirming for us that this is a list. 
The second is you can use the names function. So we've used call names just a little bit before to figure out what the column names were for a data frame. A lot of times list will have names for each of their elements. So you can use the names function to see what those are. We'll do names for this object. And in this case, we name that element one and element two. This can help you if you want to then go in and check out and see what element one is using the dollar sign uh, uh, indexing. The STR function, which, which stands for structure, is also really helpful. So if we run that on a list, it will print out some information where it goes through and it kind of does this hierarchy that lists tend to have. So this is telling us that this list has two main elements as we go down from that first level. These are the names of the two main elements, first element one and then element two. As we go across, we see that element one is a vector with integers. It's got five values and it shows us the first of those. In this case, there are only five, so it's showing us all of them. Element two is a tibble and it's got elements within it. It's got its two columns. The first of those is letters and that's a character data type. And the second is numbers and those are integers. And again, we're seeing the first few values in each of those cases. As a note, lists can contain other lists. And when you use the str function, you can really dig down and see that structure. So here I'm creating a list where the first element is its own list and the second element is its own list. So when you do str there, you can again see how that lets you see this hierarchy where it says that at, starting from the very beginning, this is a list of two items. And then when you look at the first item, that itself is a list of two items, these two letters. And then if you look at the second item, that is also a list of two items. STR can be really helpful if you're working with a smaller list, but sometimes you'll work with objects that have lots of things in them. And when you print that out, it's just an overwhelming amount of information. In those cases, there is a really nice function in the list viewer package called JSON edit, and it lets you explore data a little bit. So we can look through, we'll need to load list viewer, and then we can use that and we'll use the name of, of the list object. So let's come in and do uh, the JSON list viewer, all right? And then we can do the JSON edit function from that. And when we do A, you'll see over here in your viewer window, we've got a place where we can explore. So this lets us use an arrow to, arrow to collapse or uncollapse things. And we can look through for each of these elements. We see at the top level that the list has two main elements, element one and element two. And if we click on these arrows, we can see that element one has these different values. And then element two has letters and numbers, and we can even explore down deeper in that and see what's contained in each of those. So again, the kind of interactivity of this is really helpful if you're working with a list that's got loads of data where it's just too much to explore with using STR. As a note, a data frame is actually just a special type of list. So there are many other types of lists that we'll run across, but the data frame is a special type. And you can see that if you create a data frame and then you run class on it, you'll see um, that we've got kind of the tibble in this case, and then we're going down to some, some more general types, which goes to data frame. So list isn't included here, but if we run is.list on it, it's true because these data frames under the hood actually are just a special type of list.